Hey, this is H1. We're going to be running it back with another episode talking about chess knowledge, chess wisdom, and chess understanding. And today we will be going over a game by Magnus Carlsen against um, Batsurin. Batsurin. And this was an exciting position that I wanted to go over from the Olympiad uh, chess, World Chess Tournament. The position is right here, and we're going to evaluate it. But before we evaluate it, let me put the stick down, getting overzealous here. We're going to have to figure out how, how can we evaluate the position fast. Everything's dropping. So what are the things that we're going to keep in mind when we're evaluating a position? Well, let's write it down. And if you want to take notes, you can too. Like get out your pen and pencil, things of that nature, right? So these are the six things that we're going to be looking at. First of all, material. So basically who is up in material. Secondly, uh, development. Or shorten it up, time. I'm going to explain all these afterwards. Third, pawn structure. And my handwriting is trash, so do not talk about it. Fourth, king safety. King safety is important. And then lastly, no, not lastly, I'm forgetting one. I, okay, I know the next one is space. Oh, yeah. And then the sixth one, center control. When you have all six of these, you can evaluate a position really fast. Let me explain right quick. First of all, material. When we're thinking about material, actually, dang, I forgot to put my timer on. All right. Dang, can you cut on? Gosh, Lee. <laughs> okay, material. So material is kind of simple. Just thinking about who is up in material, who, if somebody's up or not. If somebody is up like a bishop or a knight, or if you're below, that's really important to recognize because if you're below, then that comes with different principles than if you if you were ahead. Secondly, development time. Who has the faster attack? Who has more development in the position? Who has the least pieces on the back rank? And that could determine who has the better pieces. Usually in a chess position, whoever has the better pieces have the better game and a lot more options than your opponent. And if you have a cramped position, then, like I said before, it's different principles that you have to follow. Trade those inactive pieces with your opponent active pieces, and then your opponent who has the active pieces should be doing um, not the same, but keeping their active pieces, um, putting the pressure on their opponent. Thirdly, pawn structure. Pawn structure is important because you can tell the future and um, create short-term goals. Just like, for example, if you know what pawn breaks are. Pawn breaks can give you a very simple, simple plan to look forward to. Fourth, we got king safety. King safety is really important. If the king isn't safe, then you really don't have a game. King safety kind of trumps everything. Even if you're behind a material, uh, even if you're ahead of material, if you have bad king safety, you're most likely going to lose the game. You don't want your king to be naked. All right. Don't have a naked king. Fifth, space. Whoever has more space has more options to attack both sides of the board. You want to be the person who has more space because you want to be the person who has a flexible position. And then six, we got center control. We can kind of do away with center control and king safety since those are kind of self-explanatory. But those... Um, we can only do away with those if you're an advanced player. It should be mandatory of you thinking about that behind your head if you wanted to get rid of these terms and just make it simple for you. Because usually when I'm going, when I'm playing a blitz or a bullet game, I just think about time, quality, space. Because I know that my king should, should be safe. I know that my pawn structure should have no weaknesses. And I know that I should be controlling the center in the game. Those are self-explanatory. And that's what grandmasters do. But let's consider this position. What is going on? Is the material equal? Seven pawns, seven pawns. Two bishops, two bishops. 
Two knights, two knights, one queen, two rooks, two rooks. Equal, equal enough. Development. Now, this is where it gets tricky because you would argue that Black's pieces are not developed enough. And actually speaking, Black's last move was putting their knight to f8. But the purpose of putting a knight to f8 was to get this light square bishop out. Self-explanatory, but we're going to realize how this can turn really bad for Black. We can give white a small edge on development because all of their pieces are in the right spot to attack your opponent, which you're going to see pretty soon. Let me turn this computer down so that I can get to the position where I'm at. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Just be patient. All right. So. Pawn structure. Pawn structure is important. Both sides have the opportunity to do a minority attack. So, for example, um, if white wanted to, they can do they can set up for b4, a4, b5, and then black can set up for um, f5, f4, or, or following up following up with the g pawn. But the king is going to be unsafe at that moment. So maybe just the f pawn. The weird thing is about these positions is that those aren't the only pawn breaks, even though those would be the best pawn breaks. White could set up a pawn break in the center by doing f3, e4, or just doing e4. Black can do the same by just doing c5, but the only thing is you're sacrificing pretty much having a position with an isolated d pawn. King safety. Both kings are safe right now. We don't have to worry about the kings. Space. Who has more space? I would kind of say we really don't know yet. It's, it's pretty balanced on who has more space. I guess you can give white a kind of a little edge since white is up in development. Um, just a small one though. Just a small one. Even though the, the engine hates black's position right now, they're already giving white plus nine. Uh, not plus nine. Plus point nine it, it's still humans playing this chess position usually nobody wants to play the black side of this opening to be honest nobody wants to play the black side because it's so much easier for white's plan i'm not hating i'm just spitting facts <laughs> so last thing center control center control who has more of a grasp of a grip on the center well, if you look at all of white's minor pieces and all of black minor pieces, you would have to assume white. You've got this knight targeting um, the e5, the d4 um, squares in the center of the position, just to give you a reminder, is the e4, e5, d4, d5 square. And then we got the knight on c3 targeting the e4, d5 square. Then we got the bishop, we got the battery on the b1 h7 diagonal, and then we got the dark square bishop on this blank diagonal, but let's see if Magnus Carlsen can, can do something with this. And then we got the rook already on the e file getting ready to set up, maybe to do this pawn break on the e4. What's going to happen? Well, let's go through the next moves. h3. After h3, we got b6. Now, let me tell you something about b6. b6 isn't the best move of the position. And I can tell that because the computer right now is basically giving white a almost two-point advantage. And this position haven't been played that much. It's only been played like one time. b6 is not the best move of the position. Actually, the best move of the position would be, um, well, the moves that were played were bishop d6 and what, what is this move? I don't even know what this move is. That's not even a move. It's like, ooh. yeah, just bishop d6, usually what is played in this position, not b6 at all. But hey, black wanted to do b6 and not develop any pieces. So 
Magnus Carlsen decided to take advantage of this move because all of black pieces are looking really weird. I mean, if you had to decide on like giving black a plan, what would the plan be? Literally, what what would the plan be? <laughs> the plan I don't I don't even know. I don't even get it. But Magnus Carlsen didn't waste any time thinking about doing the move e4. Breaking the center, attacking the center completely. So that's where the center control comes in. After e4, let me move this out the way. After e4, d takes e4, right? Knight takes e4. Bishop b7, trying to develop some pieces on the black side. Knight, well, wait a minute. Bishop b7, knight e5. And then after that, knight e6. And this position is going to get a lot weirder because Magnus Carlsen pretty much showed what he was planning pretty soon. Knight e5, knight e6. And then we got knight takes f6. And then after knight takes f6, we have bishop takes f6. Bishop h7 check. Now let me just put this out there. What happens if the king goes to h8? What happens? What would white's best move be? It's very simple actually. Knight takes f7 checkmate. So the king has to go to f8. Rook a d1. Just putting black in this sufferable position. Remember the, the principle, the threat is better than the execution? Well, in this position, it's so. This bishop can't, you can't even trap this bishop by doing g6 or knight will take f7 and then the whole king will be demolished in the next few moves. Now the king's safety of the black king is being threatened, but not threatened to the point where black is losing, even though black is really losing in this position by the computer. But this is still a human game, like I always say, you know. Bishop takes e5. After bishop takes e5, we got d takes e5. No more isolated d pawn. Now we're attacking the queen. After that, the queen has to move. The queen moves to e7. f4. What is going on here? What is going on for Magnus to play f4? f4 just seems pretty um pretty aggressive we got this check that we can do maybe to trade queens what's wrong with that what's wrong with that move f4 we are threatening f5 we got this we got this king not being able to go to g8 a lot of things are happening here but black decided to go to c5 for some reason, black decided to go to c5, even though maybe queen c5 trading the, trading the queen was the best decision, but I guess we'll never know. Even though the computer is definitely against, yeah, actually, let's go into the variation. <laughs> let's just go into it. Queen, queen takes. They're saying b takes c5 is the best move, but that would damage black's pawn pawn structure if they went to b take c5 but why can't the knight take which is interesting i haven't even looked this up wait a minute <laughs> this is inter this is interesting uh if knight takes then isn't this just a normal okay so if knight takes we just got f5 and we're just going to push up these pawns like the attack still goes no matter if you trade the queens or not, which is crazy. But if you look at all of black pieces, 
this bishop, this knight is the only one out here in the center of the board. We have complete control of the center. We have the two bishops. And this is primarily a bad endgame for black. So, pretty interesting. Wasn't a lot of things for black to do, but hey, we got c5. After c5. After c5, we got f5. Knight d4. Knight d4, queen f2. Going on the same file as the king, which is always just a bad thing to think about. Queen d7, not the best move to defend, but not the worst, but not the best. <laughs> and then after queen d7, the terrible move that you want to see on the chessboard, e6. What happens after e6? There's a lot going on here. There's a lot going on here. Can black capture this pawn? No. Black cannot capture that pawn. If Black decides to capture the pawn, I, I will capture back, or Magnus will capture back, attack the king, and the queen will be under attack at the same time. Then White will get a free queen. So Black had to keep this section closed up, and White's main goal is to open up the section by trading these um, pieces that are defending this king on f8. Black decided to do queen c6. What happens after queen c6? What is white's best move in this position? What would you guess? Dang, the dang camera turned off on me, but we're back at this position. We're back at this position. What was white's best move? Well, Magnus Carson played the brilliant move. Bishop e5. What's the point of bishop e5? Well, this bishop is targeting this g7 pawn. We can do sacrifices on this g7 pawn, and we're threatening to go to, to, to simply go to queen g3. Queen g3 can ruin all of black's position. We don't have to capture anything. We're keeping all the tension of the position, and now black has to deal with it. What are we doing? Well, black decided to go to rook d8. Rook a d8. And then Magnus Carson was like, so what? Your position is already done. Why should I care about what you're doing by bringing in all these pieces late into the game? So Magnus Carlsen did queen g3, attacking this pawn. And then Black had this last moment to do some ditch effort to make Magnus Carlsen think about this move. So Black decided to do knight e2, which kind of seems pretty good because now white is forced to take the knight and then black get an exchange. Woohoo! Yeah, you get an exchange. That's that's really cool. Yeah. Is it though? Is it? I don't know if that's cool. You just go to king h2 and the same stuff is happening. My queen is attacking your g7 pawn. We're threatening to capture this g7 pawn with either piece. We're threatening to capture f7. We got the rook on the e file, so if the king tries to run away, it's definitely gonna get checked. What, what can black do? Well, black decided that the king cannot stay there or it will be checkmated in the next few moves, so we're gonna try to run. We're gonna try to run to the queen side. But then Magnus Carlsen had an excellent move afterwards. And this excellent move that Magnus Carlsen decided to do was Bishop F6. Now, this was an excellent move because of two reasons. One reason is we're, we're avoiding this king from escaping to the queen side. Then the next reason is this is just a complete blowout. This was the best move of the position. This king cannot go on this diagonal uh, on d6 because of this queen. This king cannot go to d7 because of this e6, e6 pawn. This king cannot go to d8 because of this bishop. So the only two moves that black is allowed to play in this position 
Is G takes F6 or King takes F6? What happens in both of those moves? If G takes F6, which black resign after Bishop F6, let me just put that out there. Nobody wants to play a game where you're losing, especially if you're a grandmaster. After G takes F6, pawn takes F7, and this is completely lost. If king captures pawn, I got a stick for a reason. So if king captures pawn, queen g6, force king up, checkmate on g8. If king just moves to d8, I get a free queen. I mean, I get a bishop, not a bishop, dang. I can't even get my pieces right, but I get a rook. And if you take back with the queen, I get a free queen and you're definitely losing that position. So we can't, we can't just take the bishop with the pawn because that's completely losing. What if we capture with the king? If we capture with the king, same stuff happens. Queen e5, you do not want to move up. You, you don't want these problems. After moving up and then going to f6, that is so ugly. You, do you want that? Would you, would you want to deal with that? I know I wouldn't. But after king e7, then you're, you're dealing with this again. You're dealing with this move again. It's, it's just so ugly. I don't want to, I don't want to think about this. Like, I, oh my goodness. This is so ugly. I'm just, I'm just trying to look at if there's any more moves to take, to take from. And I'm like, gosh, Lee. Do y'all really want to finish this? Y'all probably wondering why, why not just take the, take the pawn? I, I'm sorry for being ahead of y'all. I'm just thinking about the position right now. Just if I was the black pieces, I wouldn't want to play this, especially after seeing this move, Bishop G6. Just taking a, a just taking a rook. Actually, after King G8 or King F8, it's checkmated two moves. Y'all see this? It's checkmate in two moves. Like, what are you supposed to do with that? But anyway, this is the power of evaluating a position. Magnus Carlsen knew that black pieces looked a little bit of weird. They're, they was pretty much they was pretty much the, the kids that sit in the black uh, they was pretty much the kids that sit in the back of the classroom. You don't want to be that kid. You want to sit in the front and, and, and get A's and be that, that student that if my camera shuts off one more time, I'm going to slap it. But you want to be that student that, that asks questions. All right. You don't want to be anything else. So thank you for picking this episode. I really appreciate it. Hey, and stay notified on my next content.